Good evening, everybody. I call the uh, special meeting for the Ames City Council for February 1st to order. Welcome, Council, and those in attendance. Tonight's the first night of three nights in a row where we talk about uh, budget presentations, and mm -hmm. I always look forward to this and hearing from staff and seeing what's going on. So we'll get started right away. And uh, Steve, we'll let you take it over. And uh, as you said, now the next three nights we're going to review our actual budget itself, our program budget. So if you will, most of the department heads are going to try to concentrate on the services we provide. Obviously, there's a financial implications to this, but we're not going to concentrate on the money as much. But if you have questions about it, they're certainly prepared to answer those questions. So we're going to be talking about um, uh, the services, and you'll notice we also have performance indicators. You might have some questions about too, okay? So as always, keep it informal, and you'll interrupt us as we go along. And she always starts us off, so that's the beginning of our budget here. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. I'd like to start off by thanking the council and the city administration for their leadership during this past year, and really the past two years of this pandemic. It's times like this that values are put to the test, and I think the city's strong foundation and commitment to, ex to its excellence through people principles allowed us to respond and adapt to our service models, respond to our community's needs in creative and innovative ways. This was certainly the case with the library, and we added back services this past year, making the most of our COVID innovations, be it outdoor programming and using new technology to reach more people in hybrid and virtual environments. Um, adapting our services. I think he's ahead of me. We haven't, we haven't practiced this, so Bill. <laughs> <laughs> so this time last year, the library was returning to the lobby, to lobby services after offering curbside services. You'll see our skier um, in the picture there. We had someone come by in a, on a skis. Um, but that was after, yeah, after there'd been a spike in the community and we were responsive and nimble about how we could best provide services. Um, but we were full access by March and ready to transition our creative online programs to new hybrid and in-person offerings. We can't really talk about past adaptations, current offerings or future planning without acknowledging how incredibly agile and flexible our staff volunteers and communities have been as we navigated the ups and downs of these past two years. Throughout the pandemic, the library remained committed to serving our customers, staying connected and meeting their needs in new and different ways. The library uses its strategic plan launched in the fall of 2020 and created with input from community stakeholders and residents to focus our ongoing work in the areas of equity, inclusion, civic engagement, access, wellness, and staff development. This has guided us in doing thoughtful, challenging, and impactful work. I'll be highlighting these themes as we move through our presentation, touching on the key service departments in the library that correspond to the budget pages you have before you. So I'll kick off with our library administration team, which has the responsibility for overall staffing um, and operations of the library and includes key teams like IT, volunteer resources, and building maintenance. Excuse me. Um, we should be on page 184, I believe. Yes. Thank you. Um, a project of note this past year was the installation of our new telescoping automatic front doors. These uh, hands-free entry allow for easy access for all. We remained open during the install and heard appreciative comments right from the start with a double wide stroller going through um, one day and um, someone with a, a stick that they use for assistance with a visual impairment, noting, um, you know, with surprise and delight, you know, how much easier it is. Cause really those other doors were heavy. It was awkward placement of the handicap button. And so um, only positive good things about these doors. And I think they look seamless. You would never really know. Um, another addition, last year was the adult changing table um, that was done in partnership with Friendship Arc and grant funding, um, but makes a big impact for caregivers and adults with disabilities. Also under library administration is IT, which has been critical in helping the library respond to changing community, community needs. Um, they boosted our Wi-Fi signal. We've improved patron printing experience, so it's um, better remote printing document scanning, and easy card payment options. Um, we upgraded our public PCs and laptops to meet the needs of an increasingly digital world. So they all have cameras and we have um, headphones. 
Um, we're updating the staff PT PCs at our auditorium projectors. That's a heavily used space, our auditorium. That's happening this year, so that stuff's coming up. Um, we upgraded public meeting room technology, including um, new monitors and the OWL devices, which I think you guys are familiar with, that offer whole room camera and mic technology, allowing customers to host hybrid meetings um, for virtual and in-person attendance. And those have been really well received. Um, so we have them in kits. They can request them when they book their meeting room and they um, get the equipment when they check out, but we do have like our adult services team who will come over and help anyone set it up. And once they get the groove on, um, they, they make pretty good use of that. And a lot of uh, community groups are appreciative of that option. Um, you can also now book two of our smaller study rooms. Those used to be, there's some in our adult area, some in our youth area, and those were more on-demand, smaller meeting room spaces that are used constantly. Um, but there was a need sometimes for that smaller meeting room where you would maybe go one-on-one -on -one, um, for a job interview, like kind of, or televisit, or we even have families or um, social workers who use them for uh, family visits. So we did change that process based on community need. And so, so two of those you can book in advance because it's hard to have a job interview and not be able to book it in advance. So several are just still on demand, but a few more are available in advance. Staff development was a specific area identified in our strategic plan and in sync with work being done in libraries across the country and along with broader city and council goals, the library formed a diversity, equity, and inclusion team that helped us identify a trainer and is helping to guide some library-focused learning at two staff day trainings. So we had one in November and we have one coming up in on President's Day. And this group is also facilitating some small group conversations with staff. And that's been really helpful. I think it helps build those relationships and kind of allocate some space to talk about what would be heavier topics sometimes. So that's being well received. Volunteers. Our volunteers are very special to us at the library, and they play an important role in nearly all of our services. And we know that we play an important role for them, too, by supporting their community connection in ways that let them be valued and um, can, valued active contributors in the community. Uh, we made sure that we stayed connected with them. People came back at different comfort levels. Some were right back right away. Some took a little longer. Um, lot, lots are, are um, with us again. But we stayed connected with them through cards and calls and newsletter updates. And uh, But we are so excited to be planning an in-person volunteer appreciation event for them this spring. Sheila, I have a question. I have a question on that. Um, outside of Mary Greeley, I think the library probably has one of the highest levels of volunteerism and we, we couldn't operate this library without this army of volunteers. I noticed in the materials that there's a pretty significant reduction in volunteer hours. Um, is that hampering your operations at all? I, I think there's at the margins a little bit. I think a big drop in the number was the youth that wasn't there as part of it because they account for a large chunk of it. So I think some is accounted for there. Um, I, I feel like, you know, it's a little down, but um, I, I feel like uh, they're still they're still with us. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I just assume that it shifts some of that responsibility to staff to make up that difference. So we really appreciate the, the seriously, it's just an amazing number of people who are involved in volunteering at the library it just that caught my attention so yeah hopefully that will continue to rebound i think it will i think and sarah on our team runs a wonderful operation yeah, she's there. amazing um next up in our budget pages is the resource services team mm -hmm. um so they're responsible for all things collections so they make sure that our diverse community has easy access to responsive collections and they purchase and catalog materials in a variety of formats. So you'll see our world language materials, we're building on those. You'll see our quick picks, that's a um, hot new bestsellers or um, popular DVDs that you can get on demand. Those We hold some aside that you can't put on hold so that there's a those um, you know desirable titles. There's always something available for you. Um, but it's beyond the books. You know, they, they catalog and process our special collections like our STEM kits and our park packs. We have role-playing games and adventure passes where you check out, you know, museum passes and things like that. I did put a slide up of the um, those colorful boxes, which used to be our vending machines for our DVDs and our um, video games. 
and the software just wasn't keeping pace. And so we gutted them and, um, but you reused the boxes because what else we, we had, it's a challenge to store a big bulky park pack or a STEM kit or role playing kits. And so we repurposed those into bright, colorful things that already fit in the space. So I thought that was kind of a clever innovation. Um, our downloadable ebooks and um, our, our collection also includes our downloadable ebooks, audio, and videos. Electronic collections were already increasing in popularity, but have seen further increases in the past two years, and we project that will continue. Um, and while print is absolutely not going away, everyone always asks that, but it's not going away, um, many of our customers are getting more familiar and more comfortable with downloadable content and enjoy that convenient 24 um, hour access. And I did, tried to avoid a bunch of statistics and stick more to the, um, you know, visual photos and things like that. But I couldn't resist putting um, some of these downloadable ebook, audio, and video uh, stats there because you can see they're all um, connecting or increasing. Um, I think downloadable audio is a big area. And um, I'm pleased with that online tools and database use because those are the things um, that are um, that we continue to evaluate and update our online subscription tools. So, so those are like kind of curated specialty things, news resources, research articles, language learning, car repair, resume writing, test prep, job skills, genealogy, all these great topic things. And I think you'll be pleased to know that there's a new health and wellness database that should support council goals for a healthy community. Um, another important area there is our online learning tools for student success. Those are resources geared to support homework help and student success, like our BrainFuse, which is a free online, live online tutoring program. Um, so you connect with a live tutor so you could do math problems together on a whiteboard. So I know we've heard from the schools that math support for math um, is a big area, but they also will like proofread papers or even up to college essays. So it's a, it's a great resource. Um, and uh, it's available. And BookFlix is another one that read aloud, read along stories available in English and Spanish. But when you have so many amazing collections, programs, and services, you need to make sure you're telling people about them through print and social media and other ways. So you'll see some of our, um, the way we're trying to touch people, that's our Instagram <laughs> stories. Um, we took advantage of the, the popular Bernie meme and plugged him down with our whole area. Um, people, uh, it's, it's fun to kind of look at to see what, what people respond to, what they like. You got to mix it up. Can't all be um, promoting services. You got to have a little playfulness in there. And then, of course, our page one. And we added that Instagram channel this past year and are always exploring creative new ways. Um, next up in, is our children or youth services, which is uh, continues services to children and families continues to be in high demand. Our at-home activity kits and online story times and age-level grab-and-go bags were very popular last year. Um, we gave out over 9,000 kits. And those are, um, they're like science kits and they corresponded to a video <laughs> online. So, um, but our families were eager to connect with us in person and it showed, they came out in, in um, droves this summer. They read over 2 million uh, minutes as part of the summer reading challenge and turned out for dozens of programs that we held some of our specialty things at Banshell Park, um, but we had story times with the bookmobile in parks all over the city. And so um, that really helped us stay engaged and be safe still. Um, but we fed their minds and their bodies by partnering to offer summer meals. That's an important piece. And we kind of time that with programming so you can go to a program and then come have lunch. Uh, we served uh, 1,464 meals this past year. Sheila, mm -hmm. what accounts for the, the tremendous increase in the number of teen programs? It seems counterintuitive given that most things dropped in number were that exploded. They really, uh, they really latch on to that online piece. So we had a Discord channel. So it's a little bit hard to exactly capture it. You know, they, they did a lot of like um, Zoom programs, the tag group did Zoom programs and things with teens. But then um, we also had a Discord channel and you put out a topic for discussion. And so, you know, we tried to be thoughtful about how we were capturing that, counting that as a program. You didn't want to discount it, but it might be, that's probably not going to be as sustainable because it mm. had that, that unique platform. Um, 
we, we have STEM grants um, that we're exploring, uh, art, science, robotics, kind of taking that outside the building too, at programs um, at the Boys and Girls Club and ECPC after school program. And the teens that you mentioned, you know, did a lot of connecting online and um, tried to offer programs, you know, with their involvement and with their needs in mind. So you'll notice the Mindful Teen. Um, that was a series we did this past fall. And I think there's ways we might try to replicate that. We did that with Iowa State Extension. And then the teens are back for other, other um, video games and other like regular programming and hanging out time. Uh, and we revamped the teen space and are ordering some new furniture. Uh, we're meeting the needs of our adults with a focus in civic engagement and wellness through a range of partnerships. So this spring we had the multiple vaccination clinics at the library, uh, worked with several organizations to host the school board candidate forums. That's just one of the events. There were three. Um, and that one, even though it looks busy, it wasn't nearly as crowded as some of the others that were standing room only and we had overflow spaces. So I think that role in community engagement and or civic engagement is, uh, is a definite role that we can support. But we partnered with various other community organizations, the city departments, university. Um, so you'll see there a climate action, climate change theater action, um, United Way, a hunger awareness. I think there's lots of opportunities there and we welcome those. We work in collaboration with the Bridge Home to host them at the library and it just is that added access, visibility and connection as the library is already serving that key population. So it's kind of meet them where they're at and a little bit of relationship building. So we're seeing, seeing some good results with that. They spend some time in the youth and sometimes sometime in the adult area. Um, and we did hear a nice story about a mother of a two-year-old who felt um, easier to connect with the services at the library. Um, so that was encouraging. And this is a model we could potentially replicate. You know, it might be on a smaller scale with just information tables or kind of a, or it might be a little longer with like, uh, you know, kind of hours, you know, or a dedicated space. So we'll see what the need is and what the interest is. And using our strategic plan as a guide, we were intentional in offering programs that are inclusive and amplify underrepresented voices in the community. So that's our more than monoliths, some other programs. Our library customer accounts is the next area who are, they're our first line of welcome and one of our top teams when it comes to process improvements. They're always looking to ways to expand, to respond to customer needs and make the library easier to do business with. Um, they played a huge role in identifying the need and editing our library card welcome brochure. We had to kind of slim it down uh, to prepare it to be translated, so which we did in Chinese, Arabic, and Spanish. They also make the use of our translation devices. And so just uh, like a week or two ago, there was a family who was struggling a little bit and they you know, walked around from behind the plexi, had the translation device and communicated in Vietnamese. And it was such a relief, you know, to, to that the person was feeling heard and they could make that connection and the staff felt empowered. This team is all about access. They support our immensely popular Wi-Fi hotspots, which continue to provide a vital digital connection to community members in need. And they took it up a level this year. There was money or monies available to, um, to provide uh, broadband access, but it was hard to get the word out. So they put it on little cards and tucked it into the little cases that the Wi-Fi hotspots came in. And so like, what a way to reach the target audience. So I thought that was, uh, you know, a clever way that we could help meet that need. Uh, a big initiative that was supported by this team also was the implementation of student cards and the expansion of educator cards in partnership with Ames Community School District. So over 5,000 students or, and 300 educators were issued library accounts as part of this data sharing agreement. So basically when you registered for school, you were automatically um, enrolled for a library card. Parents can opt out, they can opt out at any time. Um, and, but the, their, your school ID becomes your library card. So um, that, that just improves some immediate access to people. And the educator cards, we had a lot of educator card accounts too, but we also did that and lots of thrilled teachers for that. So all these incredibly engaging and responsive services are designed, planned, executed by our talented and dedicated staff with the support of our generous volunteers. And in a service industry, your staff are your service. 
And they are just as critical, if not more so, as our physical space or our collections of materials. And I just wanted to, I thought they were a good place to end with. So that's my presentation. Thank you. Questions for Sheila? Sheila, do we have any way to measure the success of promoting neighborhood associations at the library? If you're talking about the R1 effort that we did, mm -hmm. it was, I think that was a get to know you kind of effort. Uh, we had a small turnout, but I think it was like that building relation, you know, like with our, our city contact and kind of just establishing the interest and kind of our, our first time out. We did have people who came around and we did have people do the signs, the yard signs out front. So uh, we could probably count how many signs or something like that. I think it was a good first effort, you know, then it out of the park, you know, grand same success. But I think, uh, I think there's lots of potential there. I think we, uh, we should continue doing that. I, I am all in favor of anything that promotes outreach and engagement with our residents in Ames. So you keep it up. Go. Okay. <laughs> I, I was just going to ask about the hot spots and things. Do you have a sense of how many of those were maybe uh, adults without children and perhaps adults with children? Just wondering if families from the school district were also taking advantage of that opportunity. There probably were some, and we know some of our teens. I, you know, I'd have to, we don't, we could probably pull some of that data, but some of it would kind of be anecdotal because we don't collect that, that yeah. deep of, um, mm -hmm information on our cards. Sure. Anecdotally, I know some of our, I could probably ask um, our staff who work there just anecdotally what they're seeing. Um, I think there's a lot of adults. I think there's a lot of teens themselves. So mm -hmm. some of our regular teens who we know are kind of in precarious situations and are, are regular users of them. And I think it's kind of a lifeline for them too. Sure. Thank you. Sheila, maybe I'm missing this. We're do you have data on the bookmobile, the bus? The bookmobile didn't really go out that much last year. It was this summer. So we kicked, we started up again this summer. So there might be, actually, it's probably not in this because this is uh, fiscal no, year to a, fiscal year. Page a, 193. Okay. Okay. In our customer accounts. There we go. There we go. It's going to be slim because... It's the third line. No. Yeah, good. Thank you. I overlooked that. And then the, the other question I had, is the library working d directly with the Ames Public Schools? Do you folks coordinate or have communications about resources and programming? We do. And it's. I think it's improving slightly. That's always something that libraries always want to connect with schools. And sometimes the whatever's going on in the schools or how taxed their staff or teachers are, you know, that, that can ebb and flow. It's been my career experience. And I think that's been the situation here. I think we worked closely um, in the previously with uh, English language learners for, um, we did a, a nice evening program for that. And that, um, I remember seeing that was one of the first programs I saw when I first came here and it was so vibrant. Um, so I think that's a strong relationship right now. We're partnering. Um, we do a program called Reading Buddies. That's with uh, Raising Readers. And the school um, has been really great about pushing that out for us to get awareness. So they, they did a push out to get sign up. And I think um, a person who was very engaged there is also working closely with us for like a summer learning piece that we might do a little bit, amp up some of our summer collaborations. So sometimes it takes, you know, really good people or motivated people to, and just the right connections and you'll get more results. But also that the cards, that was huge. And that was more with their IT data people who kind of helped with that. So it's a very innovative idea. I mean, you're on the front lines with so many of our kids and one of our council goals is to try to be supportive of our schools and trying to close the achievement gap. So uh, I just thought so much of what you covered tonight was in that vein and very encouraging. So thanks for your presentation. Thank you. Other questions? I just had two for you, Sheila. One was, I see the Barnes Reading Academy is not getting funded. No, they withdrew their funding. So that's that re that reading buddies that I referred to. So Harrison Barnes, they had to rethink their, that was private giving. They had to rethink their giving. Um, so the the program itself, though, is um, was done, organized by Raising Readers. And then we were one of the partners um, and the primary partner for Ames. There's others in the county. 
uh, so that's that raise or that reading buddies program that started back up in January, and then we're getting ready to start the the spring cohort or the next cohort starting like next week. So the point is the objective. So for we're still continuing it. We use some inter we use an intern who helps for our part, and you know the the other pieces uh, are under uh, raising readers. Okay. And then can you just comment, you have support youth wellness through staff training opportunities like youth mental health, first aid, teen dating violence, and mindful teen. He can talk about that just for a second and what goes so on with that. It's just, it's an area that we, that we know is in need in the community. And so we're, you know, trying to feel out, see what's around. Um, there's been, so that mindful teen was a series that we partnered with uh, ISU Extension and they kind of brought the curriculum and content. You know, it's a little bit of a series and kind of a capped audience, you know, capped number, which is tricky for teens sometimes. So we might adopt that model to see, hey, how can we have a more accessible drop in, but still have that space to kind of meaningfully connect. So I think that was a good first effort. So I think we're looking to like tweak those so that they meet our teens needs the most. But that was one. The dating violence was one. Again, like a good start and not, I don't know, it got the the full turnout that they wanted, but I think you got to try and then tweak and try again. So I think we're committed to that. Um, you know, knowing that our teens, they're in a, a challenging place to begin with and layer COVID on top of it. And they just need that extra support. Okay. All right. Thank you. We're glad to see you back in operation and, you know, fully open and thanks for all you guys do. All right. Thank you for all your support. Thank you. All right, we can move on to utilities program with uh, John Dunn and council will be starting on page 82 um, for the uh, water and pollution control. <laughs> Any pictures of cute kids? I don't think I can compete on that. <laughs> well, good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. It's always a privilege to talk about the activities and um, not just the dollars, but how we spend the dollars in the Water and Pollution Control Department. So I'd, I'd like to start by reintroducing you to the leadership team for the department. Um, if you want to go ahead and advance, Dwayne. So they're all seated here behind me, but Neil Weiss is our assistant director. Lyle Hammes is the water plant superintendent. Gary Eshelman is the assistant superintendent at the water plant. Uh, Tyler is uh, getting two job titles. He's our assistant superintendent at WPC, and he's also acting as the superintendent right now. Mary Ann Ryan is our Laboratory Services Division Supervisor, and Dave Bloomer is our Water Meter Supervisor. So these are the folks who are responsible for making all the individual line entries that all roll up into the totals that you see in the budget. And these are also the folks who make all of these programs actually happen. So there, I just wanted to take a second and comment on a, a big hole in our leadership team. Uh, last October, our WPC superintendent, Joe Krebs, passed away suddenly and unexpectedly. And a lot of the preparatory work for both the operating budget and the CIP were done by Joe. So I just wanted to take a second and acknowledge how valuable his contributions were and how much we miss having him as a part of our team. In some happier personnel news though, I'd like to introduce you to our current cohort of student operators. Uh, the photo on the left is the student operating team at the water plant. So Daria, Haley, Katerina, and Nicole. And I would note that both Daria and Nicole are entering graduate school and they are both gonna be doing research work tied specifically to the Ames water treatment plant. And then at WPC, we've got DJ, Matt, Elaine, and Joe. And so I can tell you, uh, I say this every year, but with each crop that comes through, the future of the water industry in Iowa is pretty strong. Uh, we've, we've got a really good group of folks that are moving into this industry. So 
starting in the, the specific program areas, we'll start first with administration. And really the activities in the administrative group break down into two buckets. Uh, the first is the business side. So it's kind of the overall policy and direction. Uh, we do all of our, our marketing and our uh, engagement with the community out of this group. Budgeting, rate setting, legislative affairs all happen here. The other bucket is the technical support side. So engineering, so all of those capital projects that Neil shared with you a few weeks ago, those are all administered out of this group, as is the industrial pretreatment program, administering the fats, oils, and grease program. And also the technical folks are the ones who operate the flood early warning system for the community. One thing in our budget request that I wanted to highlight for you, you'll notice there's an FTE increase being requested. This is for the addition of a new SCADA and controls technician. So it's a, it's a position that we've been evaluating for several years and we finally felt like the workload had reached the point where we could keep this person busy 40 hours a week on a consistent basis. So they're really gonna be managing the controls at both the drinking water plant and the water pollution control facility. So we placed them in the administrative group. They'll be under Neil and he can allocate their time to each facility as it's needed. Um, they're not going to be a designated cybersecurity expert, but they will provide an important link between the plant operational controls and the IT and, and cybersecurity activities of, of Duane's group in the IT division. So starting on page 86 is the water treatment plant operations. Big story there last year was the weather. Um, and really the question was whether or not it was going to rain again. <laughs> we spent most of the summer right on that line between being characterized as a moderate and a severe drought. The photo in the middle there is actually the channel of the South Skunk River last August, and it had been dry long enough. You can see the grasses came up. And so not too surprisingly, water demand in that graph there in the upper right uh, when we got into the, the heat of the summer, we were at or near um, record demands for each of the months going through um, the, the summer last year. As far as how we budget, though, we always budget for normal years. So we don't budget for droughts. We don't budget for flood years. We budget in normal years. So that's what our budget is, is predicated on. Resiliency is a big deal in our world. And that's why scattered through both the operating budget and the CIP, um, there's a number of things that are, are designed to try to improve the safety and the security of the utilities. So there's things mixed in there like standby power, uh, new or upgraded security fencing, new or upgraded security cameras, um, some cyber security measures, certainly bringing that SCADA function in-house uh, gives us more resiliency. And, and so these are really all designed at a, a host of hazards that the utility might be asked to respond to. And one last thought about the water treatment plant is we um, hope for a, a return to more normal living conditions. We are going to try to host an open house at the water plant. Uh, we've, we've not done that since the two events that we held right adjacent to the ribbon cutting ceremony at the facility. And so we are looking on Saturday, April 23rd to host an open house there. Uh, we'll start at 10 o'clock with the general public, but we are also hoping ahead of that at nine o'clock to do an event for Girl Scout troops where we will have everything arranged, uh, having a wife who was a former scout leader Having an event where you don't have to plan anything but get the kids there and they earn a patch is a really <laughs> cool idea. So we're going to try to have everything they can do that morning to be able to earn a water drop patch. Mm. So page 90 is where the, the budget document starts on the WPC facility. Um, there's multiple activities here that all get rolled in together. There's the administration of the facility. Um, the maintenance of the flood warning hardware is done out of this group. Um, maintenance of the treatment facility, actually operating the treatment facility, and the biosolids and farm operations uh, support as well are a part of the roll up here. 
If you've been keeping score at home, it's time to click the counter over to 31. Uh, last summer, we received a Platinum 31 award from the National Association of Clean Water Agencies. Um, just reading from the certificate there, it recognizes 31 years of complete and consistent uh -huh. discharge permit compliance. And last week, we submitted our application package to receive a Platinum 32 award. So for reference purposes, is there anyone else in Iowa that has anything like this? Um, no. Uh, in fact, the, the streak that we hold, ours is the second longest compliance record in the country. Wow. So it, it really puts the facility and the, the folks who operate and maintain it among the very best of the best in the country at what they do. I'm glad I asked that question. It's yeah. even cooler when you see in the context of the yeah. whole country. In mid-December, we did get an early Christmas present from the Iowa Department of Natural Resources in the form of a new draft discharge permit for the facility. The previous permit was issued in 2011 and it expired in 2016. And under the terms of the Clean Water Act, it mm -hmm. continues to be enforceable until a new permit gets issued. Um, and so that new permit <laughs> was issued as a draft in the middle of December. The 45 day comment period closed last week and I have a phone call scheduled for tomorrow morning to work with the permit writer on any final details to be able to finalize this permit. There's a number of comments that we made on the, the permit, but I am I'm not feeling that there's anything in there that would warrant us appealing a permit, which would be the first time since 1989 that we received a discharge permit that we haven't felt a need to appeal some condition in it. Page 94 is our laboratory services division. Uh, the laboratory is one of multiple city work groups that are gonna be impacted uh, by the federal lead and copper rule revisions. Uh, this is continuing fallout from what happened in Flint, Michigan. And the rule change will impact the number of samples that we have to collect in each sample round in the types of locations where we sample. Um, if you read a lot of the trade magazines for water, there was a, a lot of emphasis placed on the fact that the new rule changes the notification requirements and how quickly a utility needs to provide notice to a, a tenant or a resident if they have high lead levels. This is one area that the rule is gonna have virtually no impact on us because we have always done that. Um, if we had a home that tested high for lead, we would make a phone call to the property, property owner right away, not wait 30 days and send them a form letter in the mail. And kind of outside the laboratory, but still related to lead and copper, um, John Joyner and I have had a, a couple conversations as we've watched these um, federal infrastructure bills and funding come available. And we're watching for an opportunity to use some of that federal money to incentivize private property owners to replace lead service lines that the property owners own themselves. They're not owned by the utility. But if there is an opportunity to leverage that federal money to try to incentivize the removal of lead service lines, we are committed to trying to make that happen. You have a ballpark on the number of properties that are served the names by lead? Um, by our count, we're right around, give or take 250 properties, um, which is like one and a half percent of all of the service lines that we have in Ames. Um, I know there are some Iowa communities that are as high as 45% of their service lines are lead. <clears throat> um, so um, a lot of credit to that goes to the public works group as they do that small water main replacement project every year. Um, those tend to be mains of that, that small size that were installed at about the same time that lead services were common. That was the typical mode of construction. And as we encounter them on a city water main project, we are replacing lead service lines at no cost to the property owners mm. if we're the ones that are disturbing it. Ball, is there a ballpark, is an average cost of what it, 
the for a home what it costs to replace yeah it's going to vary some depending on you know how far back the house sets sure. whether the water mains on your side of the street or not but i would say probably in the range of six to eight thousand dollars per service line to be replaced would probably be a reasonable estimate okay i think it also depends whether you have to open up the street or if you're timing it if if the city's opened up the street for some other reason obviously it's a cheaper thing than if the private homeowner has to open the street to have that done right so page 98 is the last of our our five program areas this is the metering services these are in a very real sense the cash registers for both water and sewer because most customers are billed both water and sewer based on their water meter readings and in the performance measures, you'll see that we are expecting to be close to 75% complete with the automatic meter reading conversion. That's a program that we're in the sixth year, I believe, of implementing that. Our ability to get to that 75% number this year is going to be heavily dependent on a resolution to supply chain issues. Um, just like any other device that's got a computer chip or a semiconductor in it, we're having a hard time getting the radio units for those meters. What's the life expectancy of one of those newer units? We would expect that the radios will last um, probably 10 to 15 years. And it's, it's really the battery life on those sealed units that are going to drive hmm. the life of them. And can you remind me, do, do these have the ability for customers to interface with them in some ways to know in real time, perhaps, how they are using um, water? Yeah, so this, this first phase does not have that, okay. but these meters have the ability to, to be converted from an automatic metering and AMR to an advanced metering infrastructure or AMI system. Okay. Um, we have been exploring that a little bit with the electric utility. Um, also, as a part of this ARA net that Iowa State is working on, this community-wide broadband internet system, um, we've talked about uh, using the water meter system as one of the pilot projects to test out that communication network. And, cool. and once you enable that, then customers would be able to log in in near real time and be able to see what their demands are. Okay. Thank you. What, what we are able to do with the system that's in there now is we can data log those meters with um, a lot more precision than what we could, you know, with just a reading that was taken once a month. So if a customer has a high bill, we can actually tell them when did it start? You know, it started on a certain date mm -hmm. um, and maybe they remember, oh, yeah, I had a bunch of family over and that's what it was. <laughs> or maybe they were completely unaware. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, the last thing for you um, is just a reminder of what I know Steve and Dwayne have already given you some indication of, and that's that we are proposing a 5% sewer rate increase, and that would be effective for bills that are due and payable on and after July 1st of this coming summer. No change to the water rates in the coming year. We would also increase any of the fees in Appendix Q that are sewer related by 5% as well. So examples of that are the cost to haul um, like septic waste to the facility or the industrial pretreatment charges or high strength surcharge. Those will all go up 5% as well. And then we would also propose to update our meter setting fees like we do each year based on actual bid prices for the meters for the brass, accounting for labor rate increases, so that our fees for there are truly tied to our actual cost for replacing the meters. All right. And last year I showed you this photo and I said, here's to hoping to a more normal 2021. Here's to hoping for a more normal 2022. Nice. So, hey, one final question. So with the drought, how did that impact the status of our aquifer? I get I get questions about that once in a while. Is it in good shape? How, do you test that once in a while? Yeah, we've got in each of our wells, we've got the ability to, to monitor in real time the drawdown 
So measuring how far from the ground surface you have to go before you get to the water. Um, we are able to spread out the demand through multiple wells. That's part of the, the reason that we've got 22 wells scattered geographically around the city. The new treatment facility with our ability to augment uh, ammonia has given the operators a lot more flexibility to be able to select which wells they want to turn on. So if we see an area where we're starting to get a localized drawdown, we can switch to a, a different well and spread that demand around. So last summer, actually the last two summers, we were not seriously um, stressed in the ability to get water out of the ground. Um, with, with the type of aquifer we've got, um, you know, it's both good and bad. You know, it's bad that it is highly susceptible to drought impacts and they come on fairly quickly but also because it is so shallow, it tends to recover fairly quickly as well when rainfall and river levels return. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Any other questions? All right. Is there an update too? You're gonna to build some new wells too, aren't you, John? Up there on a, a stagecoach? Yeah, we are. We, are the, what's, we can you give us an update on what where we stand? That'll give you yeah, some more capacity. Have, um, are working through the last of the permitting issues. Actually, um, what we're looking at right now is um, a redesign before we bid it. Um, we had originally designed that well field to have a dedicated standby electrical generator to serve those. What we're looking at right now is the ability to, along with the new pipeline, just run electric from the standby generator at the water plant and be able to operate those wells using that standby engine and eliminate the cost and maintenance expenses of having another standby engine. So hopefully this summer we'll be ready to bid that work. And be in, in service right. next year then? or, or in probably be about a year, yeah, to get them finished and in service. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thanks. That staff just seems to get bigger uh, all the time. I know. Thanks. <laughs> bigger. bigger. Many more people. <laughs> No Good evening, Mayor and Council. As we get started tonight, as always, I want to thank our divisional leadership. Uh, they were with us for the CIP presentation uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, most are here tonight. So uh, thank you for their work and support all throughout the year. As we get started uh, with our public works budget overview, here's a very high level shot of our organizational structure. You can see the five divisions that are within public works and then the work, acti work activities that we'll be discussing tonight. We begin in the utilities program with our maintenance activities. We have our water mains on page 102 and sanitary sewers on page 104. So the uh, annual maintenance upkeep of those systems. And that work activity is mainly handled with operations utility maintenance work group. And then we have our stormwater and storm sewer maintenance activity on page 108. And that activity is mainly handled by the streets maintenance group and operations. And uh, the insets on the slide, you can see our use of social media. We've really been trying to increase that over the last few years. And there's an example of how we use social media to um, identify and let neighborhoods and the public know about a water main break. And then the graph on the bottom right shows how we're tracking uh, this fiscal year with water main breaks. The red line shows our historical average. And Justin will probably hate me for saying this, but we're about five or six breaks below normal. <laughs> it's like, don't jinx it. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay. 
Um, and then um, as we continue with the next slide, but also uh, kind of sprinkled throughout the presentation, we have a few examples of how Channel 12, uh, Bill and Kate and the staff assist us throughout the year with putting videos together for outreach and public information and ed education. Uh, so the next slide, we have an example of one of those videos with our hydrant flushing. Welcome to this maintenance moment. Today we're going to talk about hydrant flushing. This annual activity happens every year, usually in late March and early April. So what's going on behind me is we are flushing over the 2,900 hydrants that are across the city. There's over 246 miles of water main in the city, and hydrant flushing helps us make sure that we get rid of mineral deposits or sediments that build up in the system, and it also serves to ensure that hydrants are working so that we have fire protection throughout the city. Finally, it can help us identify weaknesses or closed valves within the system. The city uses up to eight employees out flushing hydrants at any one time. The flushing is expected to take seven to eight days, and you can follow in real time at cityofames.org slash hydrants. There's a link to a map there where red hydrants have not been flushed, but the green hydrants have. Finally, one side effect of flushing is the fact that it does stir up rust and minerals temporarily within the water system. So please use caution when doing laundry or other activities as rusty water can stain. Simply running the cold water tap in your home is enough to clear the water for a few minutes. If needed, rust remover can be found at City Hall, the new water plant, or at all fire stations. For more information, you can visit us on the website at cityofames.org or call the Public Works Office at 239-5550. That's all for this time, and thanks for watching. <laughs> so one neat thing in that video, if you caught it, was the uh, interactive map that showed the progress of the hydrant flushing. So that's just one example of the work that our geographic information systems group does uh, throughout the year and, and throughout many of the departments in the city. We'll talk more about the GIS activity in a few minutes. Then continuing in utilities, we have our stormwater permit. So in our suite of smart initiatives that we have across the city, this is our smart watersheds. And we have a big reason to celebrate this year in 2021. Ames was named Rivertown of the Year. So that was very exciting. And of course, um, public outreach and educational efforts are one of the key activities that we have in our smart watershed um, activity. And uh, some examples of that are the eco chats. And we have those coming up monthly starting this month. So February through August. Uh, it was a very popular activity last year. And several sustainability events. Um, a couple of the insets there on the slide show watershed cleanup activities that we partner with. Um, we'll also be having a kind of a refreshed eco fair this year. So uh, keep your eye out for more information on that. Um, continuing then in our utility program, next we've got resource recovery. And another reason to celebrate, um, our existing uh, landfill, our former landfill that we um, have been monitoring on the west side of Dayton, north side of the railroad tracks, uh, we've been under uh, a closure permit with the DOT for over 20 years. And the DOT, because of the good work and the stewardship from Bill and the work group at Resource Recovery, have closed that permit and issued an environmental covenant for us. So that acknowledges the stability of the landfill and the good work that they've been doing over the years. And also we've been working to uh, continue our longstanding partnership with the Boone County Landfill and working on uh, continuing our agreement with them over the coming years. Important work that we have coming up, of course, is the waste energy alternative study and presenting the uh, draft findings of that to the city council. We'll be doing that this spring, um, hopefully in March, but uh, we'll be presenting that this spring along with the uh, electric services group. Um, Diversion is a very important activity, not only uh, processing the waste that comes in, but also in diverting the maximum amount of waste from being landfilled. So the, in, the background photo here shows one of those activities. That's our great pumpkin disposal. Uh, so that's a, a fun activity that we have every fall. 
Uh, we also have longstanding activities with glass and metal recycling, household hazardous material collection, and our food waste diversion program continues to grow. So we uh, talked last year how, how we were uh, going to try to further our uh, partnership with the WPC plant and handle our food waste diversion collections with anaerobic digestion at the pollution control, water pollution control plant. So we continue that work with them. Do I have a question about that? Um, that the unit that does that, the anaerobic digester, is that the type of thing we could put elsewhere? Like if we had another facility that wanted power, but we didn't, but we wanted it easier for people to drop off food waste, or if, or if we didn't want to have to haul it all the way out to WPC. Sure. Does it take a lot of water to run that, or could it just run on the food waste itself? I'm not sure the amount of water that it would take to, to run a unit or the scalability of that. Um, and, and working with WPC, they've, they've got a lot of headroom, if you will, for the waste collection. So we've got a lot of ability um, uh, to do that with them. But uh, yeah, I'm not sure the, like you said, the scalability or the portability of, of having different units throughout the community. Um, Bill, do you know anything about that? I do know about that. I know one of the things we're looking at is options for different drop-off sites. Yeah. We can then transport down to WPC. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Sure. And then uh, another activity that we're really proud of is the rummage rampage. So that work has uh, continued um, end of the end of the summer semester and beginning of the fall semester as the students are moving out of their leases and new students are moving into town, uh, trying to rehome different um, items that would have traditionally before gone to the landfill. Um, so we average about 100,000 pounds that we divert from the landfill with that activity. And the next slide will show another one of the videos that Channel 12 has helped us with um, in getting the word out about Rummage Rampage. So Bill and Susan have already been working on this year's event. Uh, do you have any dates set for that? July 29th through August 6th. July 29th through August 6th. We'll be looking forward to that. I want to thank council for all their support with that activity. Um, but all, in particular, uh, council person Betcher, she's uh, put a lot of work into that and, and always manages our special collections area. Um, Gloria, is there anything that stands out over the years of maybe something that's very valuable or something unusual? The one that stands out for me was the full-sized coffin oh. that, that we had. Uh, that was a special item, and it sold almost immediately, I believe, to a frat house that was looking to set up a Halloween party. Oh, my. oh boy. <laughs> so you never know what you're going to find at the Rummage Rampage. That's right. Wow. <laughs> um, then as we continue, we then get into the transportation program. And you can see the 10 work activities that we have in the transportation program. And we begin with public works administration on page 120. <clears throat> so this is where a lot of the divisional support is organized. Um, and the Aims on the Go app in particular, the uh, organization and leadership uh, of that app is through public works admin. Uh, and McKinley, and that has been expanding into other work areas and other departments. The kind of middle inset with the, the colorful graph, um, that shows the types of inquiries that we get from our Aims on the Go app. The big spike on the left side of that is from the August 2020 derecho. Um, so some of the things that we 
obviously uh, heard from the public through the app during that time were uh, street lights out, limbs down, uh, limbs on power lines, uh, that type of thing. But uh, interestingly enough, as you see throughout the rest of the year, the, the blue peaks, that's street lights, mm -hmm. uh, street light inquiries. Mm -hmm. so. Where's the shoveling? I've been getting lots of notifications that people haven't been shoveling their sidewalks. Mm -hmm. You can be notified in case you didn't realize that, what your neighbors have reported. Oh. Yeah. So, it's um, fascinating. Okay. Right. Also, the, the bottom inset um, shows a collaboration between admin, engineering, GIS, and operations. That's one of the uh, programs through our interactive construction activity map. Uh, so we have, we have that uh, up and going on our website throughout the year. The next we have uh, engineering, that's on page 122. So of course, engineering handles uh, project, uh, construction projects throughout, the, throughout their life cycle from the concept, the budgeting, design, construction. They work closely with the uh, development community. Uh, the GIS activity is um, a citywide community-wide activity, but that's staffed and housed in engineering. And uh, we've recently uh, rolled that out of engineering and you'll see that as a standalone activity on the next slide. Also right-of-way management is handled through engineering. <coughs> and one unique activity that we have coming up this year is our enhanced survey and design. So the national uh, benchmark system for uh, coordinates and surveys is being updated so we'll need to update our local system to coordinate and tie to that national system. We also handle the pavement management system uh, in the engineering activity. And this year we'll be doing another round of data collection. So you'll uh, see a car maybe driving around the streets and collecting data on all the, all the streets in town. The stormwater permit, uh, we talked about that a little bit previously, but that work is also staffed and managed in uh, public works engineering. Then the bottom inset, um, you see some of our Iowa State co-op and interns having some fun at our holiday celebration, but we have a longstanding relationship with Iowa State with our co-op and intern program. They're uh, uh, not only gain, gaining valuable experience, but they're very valuable for us as well. And then a big celebration that we had this year, uh, right at the end of 2021, was our Grand Avenue Extension grand opening. So very happy to have that open. John, what kind of uh, data in the pavement management? What are they? What are they? Um, what are they doing? Um, what what kind of information they are they funneling to staff through that process? Sure, and uh, if. Tracy wants to give some more detail, uh, she can sure jump up, but um, they check the ride, the smoothness, the uh, amount of cracks in a certain area, the uh, whether the cracks are offset or not. Um, then that's uh, put into our system along with the roadway type, the age, uh, whether or not it's been overlaid. Uh, so there's a myriad of data that's brought into the management system and all then analyzed and, and then rated. And then we use those ratings to help us with our maintenance activities and our CIP planning. Hmm. Is that fed then to uh, our long range transportation plan too? Is that where that fits in or is that just, or is that just integrated into our own CIP projects by themselves? Uh, mainly that, but it does certainly help with our long range planning as well. Okay. Yep. Then we have our geographic information system. As I mentioned, this activity uh, was recently uh, moved out to be standalone. That's on page 124. So uh, our GIS team provides a host of mapping and informational services, uh, both internally for uh, the divisions and the departments, but also they play a key role in our public education and outreach and providing um, updates and uh, interactive uh, information to the public. Uh, one example, I believe on the top, yeah, on the top right is our snowplow dashboard. 
So the public can, uh, during a snow event, jump on that and see the uh, progress of plowing um, in their neighborhood or across the community. And I uh, mentioned previously, uh, another example is our constr interactive construction map. And also they play a key role in emergency management, both uh, in emergency situations, they play a key role in the incident command center and also uh, in just being prepared in, in that mapping and the planning activities in emergency response. Next, we have traffic engineering. That's on page 126. This activity includes project design, traffic studies, traffic modeling, the Ames Area Metropolitan Planning Organization staff and activities are within this work group. Some of the bigger initiatives that we'll have coming up this year are our bike ped master plan. Uh, so we're, uh, we've shortlisted our consulting firms for that activity. We'll be conducting interviews and reviewing proposals and then be bringing a preferred uh, consultant to council for uh, consideration and approval. This work group also receives the majority of the council referrals that Public Works gets and a great number of community requests throughout the year. And then the street lights are billed by the electric services uh, through um, this activity and the street light activity you can find on page 130. Traffic operations is next, that's on page 128. This is management and maintenance of our pavement markings, signs and signals. One of the activities that we uh, assist with is Iowa State game day traffic for football. And we recently put a, a new paint machine into service. And the next slide has a video uh, showing that new uh, piece of equipment in action. So bloopers they, where they like put a line down. Or... <laughs> uh, just want to thank council for their support and um, through the budgeting and providing that machine for us. It's a, a significant upgrade in, in both uh, efficiency and safety for that work group. Next, we move into our street system <coughs> work activities and we have our streets maintenance on page 132 and streets cleaning on page 134. And um, this activity receives a lot of public input on, through our aims on the go as well. And uh, you can see there we had over 500 uh, contacts, we call them throughout the year last year. And uh, ver very proud of the the efficiency and the speed that we're able to respond to those citizen inquiries. Uh, they average anywhere from uh, just under a day to under two days for our, our response. And also under our street system is snow and ice. That's on page 136. A few statistical updates on that. Um, we budget for 19 average events every snow season this year. I believe these numbers are current, uh, have had eight events to date. And we typically average 36 inches of snow. And we've had 15 inches to date. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out, and, and we'll, you'll see on the next slide, is we've been tracking our event response. So our average time to uh, respond to a snow event, a winter event, from the time we hit the streets to the time that we finished our activities. 
and that's improved over the last decade from um, 14 and a half about hours per event down to about 11 and a half hours per event. So we've improved three hours. Hmm. Uh, so that's uh, a testament to the leadership in that group as well as the hard work of the of the employees in that group as well. So the next slide, the first graph shows that response time and then the how uh, it, it's up and down every year, of course, but the uh, the average of that is continuing to uh, get uh, tighter and, and decline over the years and improve in our response time. The middle graph that shows our salt usage, the top line, the red line is our average salt usage and we're uh, below that to date. And then uh, as pointed out in the previous slide, uh, we're below average in our snow accumulation. So that number is kind of hard to read on the red line. I think it's about 19 inches that we would be at on average and we're at 15. So uh, hitting below average on accumulation. Parking operations is next. That's on page 148. So in this activity, we have our parking system maintenance. Um, that includes our, our signage, our meters, special event support throughout the year. Uh, important work that we have coming up this year is support of the downtown plaza, and that'll involve relocating what we have as lot N. So that's our parking lot out here to the east across Clark Avenue. That'll be relocated to north of City Hall. Along with the plaza, there'll be improvements on Clark Avenue, additional parking made. And with the plaza, we'll be doing a, a trial, a pilot of smart meters that take credit cards. So it'll be interesting to see the, the utilization of, of those. Then finishing up our transportation program, we have our airport activity. It's on page 154. So as you know, we just had our airport master plan updated. So that'll be controlling our activities for the next several years. We're very happy to have our fixed based operator in place, Central Iowa Air Service. They do a great job and uh, we're working with them on renewing their contract. So we'll be bringing that to council this spring as well. And we've been working to finalize the Sigler purchase. That's of the parcel um, more towards South Riverside and south of our maintenance hangar. So we'll be bringing that to council in the next month or two as well. So that rounds out the public works uh, programs and activities. Uh, I wanna thank you for your support uh, throughout the year as always. Just a quick question on the airport. So I continue to get really good feedback from people who utilize the airport. Um, one question I had on what's the waiting list now, if somebody has a plane, they want it to be able to uh, stored in a hangar, do you have a sense of, of how long it takes to, to be able to get that space? It's hard to gauge the, the turnover. There's a significant waiting list though. There are, um, T hangers are full and I believe there's, I want to say around 10 or more on the waiting list, uh, to get into those T hangers and they don't turn over very often. Uh, but the master plans identified, uh, areas to, exp um, to grow, to uh, have additional tea hanger uh, parks. And we'd be looking uh, for a, a public private partnership on that. John, I have. Oh. You know, with the contract, we let the FBO uh, uh, collect the revenue off that as part of their revenue from them. We don't collect the revenue they do, and they set the fees. So, about thinking in the future, if they want to continue as revenue stream, Maybe we can get some private sector person to build it. They would borrow the money and then they could generate revenue, not only to pay back the principal and interest payment, but to make the, the profit off it too. So we'll see. Could be the FBO does it, could be somebody else. I have a random question that has nothing to do with anything we recently went over. It's back to the RRP. How many landfills are there still in Story County? Uh, none active. Just we have our closed landfill that was the municipal sanitary landfill and then um, 
is it aim story environmental was that the name of it that was uh mainly a construction and demolition landfill that was right adjacent to our landfill just to the east uh, that's also a closed landfill so if the boone landfill can't handle our capacity in the future how many options do we have for landfills within any kind of reasonable distance we've been looking into that uh, there's marshall county landfill so depending where you're at in Story County, a little farther away than Boone. Uh, we have potential options with uh, Metro Waste Authority as well. Uh, there's other landfills farther away. I um, believe Iowa Falls has one. Wow. And Webster City. Uh, but really, uh, Marshall would probably be our best alternative. Any other questions? <clears throat> Thank, Thank you. you, all of you, for your efforts. And Justin will hold you accountable for keeping the snow down. All right. That's right. <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Is that well, it's not good news for the drugs. <laughs> Money. Actually, Cross country skiing. Ah, uh, true. Oh, here. So it's still on the ground, right? Yeah. It's yeah. crunchy. Yeah. We just need more <laughs> of us. Yeah. Right. We don't get the benefit. Sure, that's true. Hey, Gord. Good evening. Good evening. I am here to talk about the fleet and facilities budget. I'll just kind of go over some highlights of both the programs. Um, so in fleet, um, we, the way we do it is, as you know, an internal service, uh, somewhat run like a business. So we charge an hourly rate for a mechanics that is charged back to the departments. Um, as you can see, that one up. Uh, this year, um, that's basically the personnel costs. So that's what that's recouping is that part of it. Uh, the rest of fleet is covered mostly by administration fees that covers all the other things we do. Um, you can see that kind of below purchasing equipment, tracking equipment, um, making sure fuel and things like that. Um, you can see how many purchases of vehicles and equipment um, we did in 2021. Um, just wanted to, we're also working on uh, updating our kind of offices, kind of bringing them up to a better style than uh, maybe the late 80s that they are now, and uh, increasing some of our storage, because um, we keep every booklet that comes with a vehicle in the offices. Um, so the booklets keep getting bigger and bigger, so we need more storage. Tell what uh, page are we on? Uh, 266. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry, my apologies. No, thank you. Um, fuel. Um, Dwayne uh, always lends his expertise to help me estimate fuel. So um, we kept it flat this year at 245, and you'll see that on the next slide. Um, we are predicting, or Dwayne, you know, we think it will potentially go down. And this chart kind of shows um, our fuel costs, and this is through the DOT, um, who we contract with to get our fuel. Um, so you can see it did kind of, like everyone's noticed, jump up in the last year. Um, but we it, still aren't where we were, you know, um, 10 years ago. Um, so it's it was pretty level there for quite a few years, but it jumped up. But we're hoping it goes down a little bit next year because that's the biggest driver for our departments is the fuel cost. And then we show the B100 is kind of based on diesel cost, um, kind of when we buy the diesel, um, which that'd be the 285. So you can so it, it's cheaper than the diesel. Um, next slide, just kind of, I know you'll be talking a lot about climate action plan, so just wanted to show, this shows the total gallons of our fleet over the last nine years. Um, pretty consistent in a kind of a narrow band, um, but we are kind of trending down um, throughout the years. Um, a lot of it's driven by weather, um, so if we have a bad snow season, you'll see fuel go up because the trucks used for snow plowing get, you know, three to four miles a gallon. Um, and when they're running 24 hours a day. Um, the next slide just kind of shows kind of all the different um, fuels that we use, gasoline, uh, ED5s in gray. Um, you see that kind of dipping down um, and uh, diesel went down <clears throat> as well because we went to B100. So if you see that bottom line, Basically, the B100 replaced the drop in the regular diesel. And that's because we're using it in our dump trucks. 
And then you can see uh, E85 will probably continue to go down. As you know, the police hybrids um, cannot use E85. The old police vehicles did. Um, we still use E85 in most of our light trucks, but um, the new hybrid vehicles don't allow for E85. Our next slide, kind of the green fleet, uh, we're up to 28 uh, percent roughly of our fleet. Um, that does include kind of flex fuel vehicles, but we're showing the new hybrid police cars. Um, we were actually able to buy the hybrid Explorer for the for the fire department um, using for one of their chief vehicles. Uh, the upper right shows the Optimus, and that's how we do the B100 conversion. And now that's on all 12 snowplow trucks this year. Um, so the next slide kind of talks a little bit about the B100. You can see we're up to, um, in two years, we used 24,000 gallons of the B100. Um, we're now selling um, B100 to the Iowa DOT. So we're kind of reversing what they do for us. Um, they have a couple trucks that they come fuel on our site to do that. So you can see we're, the carbon reduction there, that 225 metric tons, um, just from the benefits of the B100. How long is the pilot program supposed to last? Uh, the pilot program was for three years. Um, obviously, the new seven trucks were not part of the pilot. So those were um, paid for um, by the street department to put those on. Um, we will have to talk to REG about the lease of the fuel tank after the three years. So that'd be the only piece now. Um, the units on the trucks that they helped us with, we keep those. Hmm. But we would have to renegotiate the lease in the B100 pricing. Um, but I ex expect both of those work. Um, we've received lots and lots of calls from all over the country about this program. Um, we talked to cities. I think Des Moines looking at now putting in a B100 tank and installing this system. Um, but all over the country, uh, Rich Iverson, who's kind of taking the lead. He's spoken at a lot of Zoom conferences the last couple of years. Um, so it kind of worked out, but there's a lot of interest in it because um, it works so well, it's kind of hands off. And I think that's what a lot of people are looking for. Um, a lot different than some cities with the compressed natural gas, things like that for the heavy trucks. So the next slide. Um, so the talking about the Climate Action Plan. Um, so a uh, member of the technical team, um, been talking to the consultant about the assumptions for fleet. Um, obviously going into the future, it's gonna be what's needed to meet the goals and then creating a plan. Um, a large part of that's gonna be also building upgrades, not just for that part of the Climate Action Plan, but the building upgrades for the vehicles. Mm. Um, so that's something we'll really have to consider um, as we move forward. Um, so the future um, hybrid and electric vehicles are expanding. Um, we put funding in this budget to purchase our first all electric truck, uh, Ford Lightning. Um, that will go to the street department, um, one of their supervisors, so we can kind of see how that works in the range and mileage and um, inclement weather. Um, we are also looking at a hybrid truck to replace, uh, instead of a small truck, the new Ford Mavericks are hybrids. Um, and they're considered the compact truck, but they're actually about the size of the Colorados and Rangers from uh, 10 years ago that you still see occasionally going around. So um, we think both of those will be great options. Um, but some of the challenges, uh, supply chain delays. Um, on the fleet side, we're not seeing that as much on parts. Um, but we are seeing it on vehicles um, and then consumer demand. So both those are going to push us next year because on the all electric and hybrid, I'm not sure we'll be able as a government to get in the queue for the first years of those. Um, so we might be looking at into 2023 before we could get those vehicles just because like the Ford Maverick is sold out <clears throat> and I'm expecting the Ford Lightning to sell out. So. There's a possibility Ford would open it up so they could show that governments are using them. But again, where are we in the line compared to some of the bigger cities? And the supply chain delays, like I said, parts um, aren't as bad um, unless you get into electronics, but um, we don't have a lot of those failures. But 
Um, vehicles, even this year, are taking, usually we're at that uh, four months tops to get a vehicle. Um, we have vehicles now that are been ordered for eight months. And um, we expect next year, every vehicle will probably be six to 12 months to get the vehicle in, um, unless it's pretty standard. So the more specialized the vehicle, the longer it's going to take. Um, so if you're ordering a chassis to be upfitted, those are going to take quite a while. Um, I know we were working, as you know, we work with the hospital. Um, they had an ambulance that was in an accident and they ordered a chassis and they were told no delivery till 2023. Oh, so, so we'll do the best we can. Um, luckily our fleet's in pretty good shape, but we will see that kind of, um, so you probably see that in carryovers. We're going to have probably a lot more carryovers than we did usually. Um, so that's kind of the fleet side. Any questions on fleet? Corey, on the, uh, I know uh, fleet services, you got trucks are sandwiched in there, you know, with the snow plows on the, uh, I think the west side. Yep. Um, is there going to be a need in the future for expansion to that facility for more parking or you just are able to not require that, you know, long term? Um, so as you saw on the first slide, our fabric building is complete. Um, back behind the facility, um, the electric's up and running now. Um, so that should help us um, for the foreseeable future. Um, we're able to store some vehicles out there. Um, we're still parking most of the plow trucks in the building, but it, some of the other um, pieces of equipment, we can winterize the sweeper and put the sweeper out there, things like that, that we couldn't do in the past. Um, so I think it'll be a help. It's just kind of finding that right balance. Um, and I you know, like the graders parked in there now, um, where that was usually parked outside all the time. So I think that's gonna help us for the foreseeable future, but I'm sure at some point, um, you know, there'll be more discussions about that, but I think that's a ways off now. So on the facility side, uh, just go through um, kind of the first slide, just kind of what's going on right now. Unfortunately, we're still dealing with COVID-19. Um, not as much, um, not as much plexiglass as we were at the beginning, but we're still talking mask and what style of mask. Um, most of that's for public use. Um, so our two biggest users of masks right now are the library and parks and rec. Um, but we're going to the surgical style now versus cloth and things like that. But um, we have several spots throughout buildings where people can grab a mask if they need it. Um, as we talked about, the fabric building is complete. Um, key card access is 99% installed um, here at City Hall and the fire stations. Um, bringing it online, um, we'll be rolling cards out in two weeks. Um, we'll work through some bugs and how it works, but um, you'll be getting your cards here in a couple weeks. Um, so you'll be able to enter the building um, if you need to. And uh, we'll keep some, this will allow us to keep more doors kind of locked. Um, there's a few back doors to offices that we can keep locked versus in the past, the first person that keyed through, it was unlocked the rest of the day. So that'll be, um, a really big improvement for this building. Um, and also help with customer service, um, for, you know, our after hours meetings for different groups, instead of having to get a physical key, um, they won't have to actually come here, hopefully to get into and hold their meetings. Um, as you've seen me, we're uh, still working on the downtown plaza that will be coming before you soon for hopefully bidding and uh, also be assisting on the indoor pool with Parks and Rec. Um, myself and uh, John Forth, our building maintenance specialist, will probably help review the design as we go through that project. Um, I'll also be kind of handling the day-to-day -day construction management and billing of the downtown plaza. Um, and Parks and Rec will focus on the indoor pool during that time. Um, as you've probably seen, we've, we have hired a consultant. We've been working on interior updates, which is new carpet, painting, all that. Um, John Forth has been working really hard to remove a lot of wallpaper. Um, colors were decided, so the green is starting to go up. Um, so it'll be light gray and some dark grays, and then the green will be around the entrances. Um, if you've seen, John's already painted those so we could get the letter <laughs> back up. So that will, uh, we're planning hopefully next month to come back before you. Um, we just need to work through the logistics with departments. 
because departments are going to have to move out of their office space for four to six weeks as we do this project. Um, so in the future, um, as part of the budget, it was Steve's recommendation to put some of the rescue funding for the auditorium HVAC to cover that shortfall. Um, so we'll rebid that for fall installation. Um, we'll be working on design and implementation. We're calling it office flex space. And this is um, Parks and Rec is planning on moving um, some of their programs out to uh, Gateway. So we would take that multi-purpose space and turn it into a conference room and cubicles or things like that for office space to kind of relieve some of the congestion in certain departments that we have throughout City Hall. Um, we'll also be looking at remodels for finance and human services. As part of that, um, right now finance has a lactation area for employees in their department. Um, so we're looking at a pod, which is you kind of like airports, you'll see these a lot, um, where it's kind of a single use. Um, so we'll buy one of those so we can open up the space in finance and put that in city hall. Um, I think we've got a space and they'll be open for public use too, but um, we're required to provide it for employees. So much like fleet, we're going to have to talk about what the climate action plan goals mean for buildings. Um, as some of you know, along well, it was 10, 12 years ago, we did cool cities and we put money in for departments and we did a lot of the, I think call it low hanging fruit projects, LED lighting, um, small HVAC upgrades, things like that. So I think this time around, we're looking at major projects and how's that going to work? Um, what could we do to meet goals in a, you know, city hall with 160 heat pumps that we have throughout the building, but how do we get meet the goals for buildings? And then, you know, our building, the warehouse, the maintenance facility, um, you know, built in the seventies and eighties, how could we meet goals in a building like that? And then throughout the year, we're just going to continue to work. Um, we always seem to have other departments and projects coming up with facilities um, that we help out with, whether it's planning or um, even providing assistance. So that is it for facilities. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Corey? Remember, this was fleet non-bus, non sirite non fleet. We talked about that. Exciting new upgrades for City Hall. Yes, it'll be a big change when it's gone. Oh, yeah. so. Very nice. By the time we remove all the blue and the pink, though, it's going to be back in style. <laughs> so. yes. You'll have a little bit of blue, a little bit of blue here and there. So. Mauve, mauve and blue. <laughs> Cocoa, I think, is the. All right. Thanks, Corey. All right, thank it. you. Thanks, Corey. Thanks, Corey. We'll move on to the finance department budget. I'm just going to stay right here if that's all right. Um, I just mentioned the, the books uh, separated out by programs and finance a little bit unique and that we're spread across a large number of programs and, and even more unique is probably the first one I'm going to cover and that's uh, economic development because there is no department or division for economic development, but we do have a program and it's, it's on page 208, 209. And it's essentially uh, the city manager and I uh, man this program for the most part. And all the expenses and revenues associated with that and the discussion of the activity, even though it's not a department division, is included in this. So the big areas of emphasis this year have been the establishment of the, an additional urban renewal area in the downtown. And that was uh, included the plan improvements for the downtown reinvestment district. We applied for, as you know, an I reinvestment district funding program, and we received a provisional award of $10 million, and that would be used to help fund the aquatic center. And we're now we're closing in on completion of our final application for that funding, and that is due uh, later this month. Uh, in some good news area, we always report on TIF in November because that report is due to the state in, in December. So most of the council was here, but there was uh, one that wasn't. Um, we are now collecting more in uh, incremental property tax than the annual debt service. So Nancy mentioned that in the fund balance that had been negative for years. Now it's positive. 
we'll uh, quite soon collect enough positive fund balance to pay off all our debt, and we'll see that go back down again. So the, uh, that, that's a good area. Uh, the only significant change in this budget was there was an increase in expense for TIF rebate payments, but that comes along with revenue that comes with it. So these are pass-throughs to two different companies that have TIF rebates. One is Barilla, one's the Kingland development. And is that whatever TIF comes in, that, that uh, amount goes out in a rebate. So that rebate expense is up, but the revenue that comes with it is also up. Now we'll move on to what is more recognizable as the departments and divisions within finance. And uh, just a couple people that are here tonight, Nancy, you see Nancy Masteller, you see her pretty regularly. Uh, budget officer Brent Moore is our IT manager. Uh, we also have uh, finance administration and budget, which is Nancy and I and two other people. Uh, accounting and reporting, we have a new manager there. You're gonna hear a recurring theme here. Uh, purchasing services, uh, information technology, Brent is uh, relatively new. Uh, customer service, uh, new manager there. And so we've, we've had a fair amount of turnover, but we're, we're working through this. And that, that does impact our budget, and I'll point out where it does. So financial services area. And this starts on 246, and it, financial services includes the finance administration and budget, accounting and reporting, uh, and debt service, and also purchasing services. So in the uh, admin and, and budget, uh, we've saw, seen some in increases, but it was due almost exclusively to op open positions and uh, assumptions that we make uh, related to hires or filling those positions. Uh, Nancy covered that uh, as part of the fund overview, and I think we covered it in a lot of department and divisions. We've seen that in a fair amount of places with the city. So we assume new hires at midpoint and the most expensive health insurance, and on average, we usually see less than that. So to the extent that we have open positions in there, not higher up the, the scale, that, that can uh, cause some increases in the budget. So we'll, we'll expect those to come in lower. Some of the areas we've been working on that are a little bit different than usual, in addition to the handling the turnover, we've had uh, numerous uh, COVID-related assistance programs, and a lot of those were related to utility assistance, but of, of course, we've seen the American Rescue Plan. We had the CARES Act that we processed. Uh, we have uh, two FEMA grants, one for duration and one for COVID, and you know, just to give you an idea how long some of these grants can take, um, we had a 2018 FEMA grant for what was not a very severe storm, but we just closed that out here recently. So th those can uh, stretch out long after the disaster. Uh, good news is Duratio is moving along pretty quickly. Uh, the COVID one, uh, not so much. We've, we've, got the, um, we've got the claims in, but this is a very new process for FEMA. So that's taken a little bit longer, but we'll get through that. Uh, we continue to Tran, uh, transition to electronic payment systems uh, through, with accounts payable, accounts receivable, and our, our treasury functions. So no real significant changes in budget in any of those areas. Uh, purchasing services is on uh, page 250. That division also includes print shop and messenger, but those are not included in the general government. Those are internal services. We've moved those over there this year. Those are on page 270 and 272. And part of the reason I point that out is because those budgets were adopted last year under purchasing. So those will drop out and, and move over to the internal services. So you'll see um, a big reduction in purchasing, but, but it's really just over on, on new pages. So you have to kind of flip back and forth to see the changes. Uh, good news is there isn't big changes between those. It's it's pretty much a business as usual uh, numbers. Um, th this division supports all the larger city initiatives. So when you see downtown plaza or the solar project or any of those things, those are supported by the purchasing division. Um, they're wrapping up Im implementation electronic bidding and vendor management system. And we're continuing to improve document management with uh, uh, electronic uh, document imaging system that is not only in purchasing, but also in finance. 
And since we don't have very many good things to take pictures of, uh, Corey talked about the card access system. <laughs> um, we'll actually have the printer for that and we'll take care of the cards. And well, yeah, it, it's, it's an air fryer with the <laughs> decals on the front. But, um, you know, the supply chain has really impacted everything. I, I think the, the cards we wanted to get, the, the, the best, the ones that work best with the system, we could only get 85 initially, but um, they're in now, they're getting printed and they're moving through. So we'll, we'll get this uh, moving forward. Information technology, uh, Brent's area, um, that's on page 268. And if you look through there, the, the only real change you'll see is uh, due to increases in equipment purchases and these are funds that are already banked or collected for departments. And those were expenses that uh, you, you would have seen in previous years. And now we're spending that as we replace equipment. Uh, that's been a little bit slow. Um, we've had some pipeline issues there too. So we've kind of shifted to just ordering computers and then we'll, we'll hold them in inventory and then get them issued out as, uh, as we can, but we, we want to keep orders in place all the time so we can uh, keep some things moving. And there's also some increased costs for equipment pur purchases in Maps G, and that's the shared communication system. So uh, we're not certain if they're gonna buy that out of their um, the money they put aside, but in either case, it'll move through IT and it'll have revenue associated with that. That's a, a shared system between us, Iowa State and the, and the county. Uh, some of the highlights, Brent's here if you have any questions, but uh, improving security with the Cisco umbrella and Cisco ISC. ISC. Uh, a big change for us is the central square, which is our enterprise uh, a system that does accounting, uh, human resources and, and payroll, as well as our utility billing. We used to keep an, an IBM I series server here on site. And it, over the years that had become the only use of that server it was a one-off, so if something happened to that, uh, you know, we'd have to get another one. So we've switched to uh, a software service or a hosted uh, situation for that. And so now it's out there with a bank of servers. It, if one of their servers go down, the other, the other ones pick it up. And it, it was essentially kind of a cost-neutral situation when, over the years when we look at replacing that service or that server. So uh, that's definitely the way that the... the industry is going, it, it kind of buys you all those tools and expertise without having that all on staff. So you think we're gonna to continue to see more of that over the years. Implementing mobile device management software improvements, a lot of mobile devices, whether it's iPads out in the field or, or cell phones. Uh, we're working on an enterprise agreement, enter into an enterprise agreement with Microsoft to improve management security and that's of all the systems on Windows which can continues to be most of our desktop systems. And again, I mentioned the, the budget increase equipment purchases. Are we seeing a delay in our equipment purchases like we're seeing in so many other fields? I mean, I, I know um, chips are one of the issues with the vehicles. I assume they're also a, an issue with the technology that you're bringing in, Brent. Yeah, correct. Our Dell purchases were typically two to three weeks max now we're looking at the two to four month period so how do we how do we plan for that if something goes out what do we have fail safe of some sort that yes, Dwayne Dwayne. doesn't have to use nancy's computer for <laughs> as Dwayne mentioned we're trying to order equipment early and put it in a, a stock situation and then we give it to the needs as they appear in the city and we'll continue to keep ordering stock and clearly it takes a long time to get in. And that that's working out okay so far? Yes, correct. And that's kind of the standard PCs. I've seen, I, I'm not sure about the higher end ones, but you've seen uh, the, uh, the video boards, the prices of those are the price of a PC now if you're a big gamer or something, if you can find them. But fortunately, we don't have too many of those type of systems. 
Just in the city manager's office. City manager's oh. office, of course. They uh, give me a computer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're ordering standard enterprise Dell computers. Uh, again, very standard, easy to manage, very scalable as far as management systems. You know, a few years ago, we had a uh, third party hack or someone hacked into, I think it was a parking. Parking. Parking, yeah, it, uh, it actually that that was a system that a lot of cities used, and they actually hacked into that that third party system. Uh, we we've gone away from them, um, so, so I, I I can talk. Parking's coming up here in just a second. Yeah, I was, so, I was just curious in terms of. I mean, I this is I'm totally out of my pay grade, totally out of my expertise, but all I know is, is security, um, just how much we rely on our systems to you know, operate, you know, the finances, the whole nine yards. And so I know you're taking into consideration. Can you just explain, is that in the enterprise agreement and Microsoft to kind of have double, triple firewalls or whatever? Um, and by the way, are you paying the invoices I'm getting in my emails for, uh, these, <laughs> we're getting these random stupid, you know, emails asking us to pay. I'm just curious in terms of not that, but. <laughs> what um what um what process or systems are you using so uh we're having the, the best you know firewall and, and protection sure well as you see on the a slide there there's a lot of attention that's paid to management and security those are the either top priorities or top one two however you would describe it those are the top priorities right now and clearly we're going to be implementing quite a bit of that next year with the microsoft service agreement uh, I don't think that covers your full question. So is there, yeah, I guess, I know that we're, I know, I know that. Uh, firewalls and security are typically hardware based. That's Cisco products. Uh, we worked with the city manager about having a long-term vision for replacing our firewalls and our network equipment on a supported basis so that when Cisco provides a supported period of five to 10 years, we wanna stay within that supported period. And when that support period ends, then we need to find some new hardware for the firewalls, switches, and all the network equipment. Probably moving some of the data on, on the cloud with companies that have better security than residing data here. Uh, clearly some of that is in our Central Square software as a service. That's a situation where we don't have the specific expertise in the IBM I series. And as uh, Dwayne pointed out, it's a one-off, so it's not cost-effective to have that amount of expertise on site. So we don't house the data here on our own server. Right. We contract with them, utilize their expertise to protect the data. It's just more getting from here to there in terms of the ability to get someone to kind of come in and interrupt or... Correct. Um, There's a significant amount of networking that goes on to make that software as a service happen. As a security, get it from here to there. Correct. Yeah. Uh, there's firewall rules in place so that you have to be on a city computer, city network to get in. Even uh, connecting from the library is an extra networking step. So we're going to double, um, what do you call it, dual, dual, um, you know, we sign in dual. Whatever. Oh, the multi factor authentication mm -hmm. is something that the city has implemented in 2019, is my memory. So we're regulars at that now. Okay, thank you. We also had analysis done. I forgot to enter, Grant, who did the analysis of our system and gave some recommendations to us? Which yeah, we had Department of Homeland Security, actually. We were looking at paying a consultant, but we thought they they did a good job and provided a report to us, and we've been uh, moving through that. Um, that has driven a lot of, especially the hardware-based improvements. And, and some of the other things we, we could just do uh, you know, the, the password, uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll get into parking ticks. That's, that's a good example. I can kind of walk through that one real quick when we get there. Any more for IT or? Nope. Thank you. Uh, next area is utility uh, customer services, and that's actually in the utility program, but that same area, same division also does parking ticket collections. That's on page 152. And if you look at the, the budget overall in this one, we've had a, a quite a large amount of turnover here also, but 
but the employees are in place and, and they're lower, uh, they're newer on the scale, uh, a little bit lower paid. So you actually see salary and benefits in the entire budget down in this area. And that was due to long-term employees, very, uh, very tenured that were at the, the top of the scale, um, retiring or leaving and, and replaced by uh, new employees that are further down on the scale. Um, same situation, uh, parking ticket collections, that's in the same division. Um, some of the highlights, uh, we, we've implemented in this area uh, multiple COVID relief assistance programs, and that, that was very helpful for our customers over the past couple of years. Uh, we've fully implemented the community solar credits, and, and those, those are the solar power packs and how they impact the owners of those credits that have, that have purchased those. And I'm sure you've all seen the, the screen uh, down in the lobby that shows how that uh, system is doing. Um, parking tickets, so that, that's a good example. Um, you know, th those we used to issue with a, a process and, and a system that we had here in house. Um, if someone paid a, a ticket by credit card, it hit our server and then bounced out to the third party that actually took the payments and that someone did what was called a man in the middle hack uh, on, on that third party server. So it grabbed them between the, the, the two servers and would hold all those credit card numbers and then would try to uh, exploit that all, all at once. So neither party knew that was happening. No one had hit our server, no one had hit their server, but they were grabbing the information in, in between. And that that's one of the problems you have when you're uh, moving data like that. So uh, for several reasons, we now have a, a, a third-party cloud-based system for our, our parking tickets. So both the issuance of the ticket and the payment goes directly to that uh, cloud-based system. It, it only hit, we, we don't see the credit card numbers. We see the, the payment, the cash comes through to us. So it, it takes a whole step out of that. It, it dramatically reduces the opportunities for someone to exploit the system. And so far it's worked pretty well. We had a couple glitches where they had turned things over to collection too early. Uh, only been a, a couple cases and we got those cleared up pretty quickly. But otherwise, I think both the police department, uh, our department and, and the customers that are working through this, it, it's been an improvement. Uh, as you, you know, the uh, parking system is not doing terribly well financially. Um, and, and as I think Steve's mentioned, you know, the parking tickets are, are, aren't really meant to be a revenue earner. They're, they're, they're meant to get people to hopefully uh, pay into our meters or, or uh, not illegally park. Our last uh, area is debt service. And I didn't do a slide on this. That has its own... Uh, activity and that's on page 260 and these are the same slides that we talked about last Friday so I won't spend a lot of time on that but the the debt service activity simply accounts for the the repayment of the of the debt that we've accumulated over the years any debt that we're issuing planning on issuing for the the next year and then any revenue that's associated with that, whether it's abatements or uh, property tax that we collect to repay that. So that's it for the finance department, unless you have any questions. Questions for Dwayne or Nancy or Brent? That's it for the... Uh, I do want to point out that we, uh, I think we passed on to you two requests for funding, additional requests for funding that you have in your packet. One from the uh, Ames, uh, Ames Historical Museum, and also one from Loris Olson. So I think you've got those now before you, correct? Mm -hmm. Those were emailed out. And um, so the question is, on, you know, I'll take those individually. Is there an interest on in referring um, the Ames History Museum request to uh, Steve for consideration as we look at the budgeting next week. You mean you want to put it on the eighth for you to determine, right? Right. Do you need any background for me, or you just you know, is understanding what they're asking, and you just want to consider it your final wrap up session? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. What is the? <clears throat> Do you ever understand the letter? 
Are, are there other additional requests that that we haven't acted on yet? Yes. Waiting to so so they kind of all come later, right? So it's the eighth. I think you still have the Main Street request. Hmm. Help me here. I don't have it all in front of me. Is but we one? didn't move necessarily to have you put those on. But it's not putting it on. I'm not asking okay. you to put it on. Those are all for your yeah. decisions to make. Sure. I'm sorry. I should clarify. Uh, it's a good question. Do we want to go ahead and place these in the same yeah. bucket, so oh, to speak, yeah. mm -hmm. as the other ones and consider those on the 8th? I'm not asking for sure. yeah, no, um, tonight to approve it, just more or less um, the one that came previously. Yeah. We got a memo from Mark saying that we couldn't do it. This is really a, a re, you know, it's, it's, they're, they're, it's a different, it's a different yeah. approach to buying, buying service, purchasing services. Okay. So. Yeah. Be good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think from um, the other one, I think. Home allies for, from Ally. From, me. Home allies from Laura Solson. I think it's for, well, you'll have to interpret yourself. I think it's a total amount for two different purposes and, I don't know. I don't think she's expecting to come out of your asset funding. I don't know. I think she's asking for extra funding, right? One for construction, one for support asset. for a unit. So there'll be three, I guess, that are outside of the funding. They're not coming through the special projects that go through Brian's uh, system that we evaluate according to criteria, right? Mm -hmm. They're not through the asset funding and they're not through any other funding. They're just three separate requests. You'll have to decide on the 8th, whether you want to include them or not. And do we know if the, the home allies request is accurate in asserting that the way it's structured is legal? No, I have no idea. Well, because initially, you know, Mark gave us that reading on the History oh. Museum request and Loris's letter oh. asserts that right. this is not right. the same. Do we know that's that's true. Accurate. I mean, she's not a lawyer, so I don't know where she got the information. I mean, and the contract for servicing piece, definitely, because we do that now with asset, right? But yeah. The construction piece. Yeah, I don't know yeah. about the construction piece. Maybe you want to ask Mark for that interpretation. Because I, I would like to have Can I read that. that correct? It seems to be two different pieces. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so let's just take it. So the ANCC Museum, is everyone, can you just get a motion to uh include this in for consideration i have one more question okay before we do that sorry <laughs> um so as we kind of discuss some of these we what we haven't talked about in a couple of years is doing another round of capital grants for nonprofits. and i don't know if i don't know how it's going to come back to us next on the 8th is it, if it's just going to be the things and we're going to discuss them all individually and just have an open discussion but I guess I would put it up for council to ponder <laughs> if a competitive grant process might be a better way to analyze some of these things rather than just having a disjointed discussion at council. And we have a precedent for it before. Obviously, we've done them in the past. Um, we're doing them with the arts grants and things like that as well. And whether we want to consider something like that rather than sort of setting a new trend where we're just going to start taking random requests. Mm -hmm. Although both of those organizations, <clears throat> well, Home Allies, I, I can't, I'm going to set that aside. But the downtown mm -hmm. and the History Museum are both already part of our city council grant process. So it's Correct. sort of like that's an add-on to what they, they already were, applied for. They were not eligible for the capital grants that we did in the past because we only opened them up to asset agencies. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, I see. So we could do like a capital grant program that perhaps would be uh, all ag do whatever we any want. agencies <laughs> that, yeah. We could target it towards certain ones or culture yeah. and economic development. We could target it towards, mm -hmm. you know, something just open and generic. I mean, it. I don't know. It's just something to doesn't doesn't that get into what's what we can't legally do because they're nonprofits? No, because we've if there's a competitive grant process, my understanding is that through the competitive grant process, then you're then contracting for a specific thing. 
which is why we've been able to do it in the yeah. past. Previously, okay. did, you'll have to, Mark's not here, but previously we did a capital grant project and we actually, I guess because it was competitive, it made it okay. We actually allocated funds for construction projects. And there were contracts signed that said they were guaranteed to be complete by a, a certain date. And this is what you were getting. This there were requirements yeah. for uh, matches and, and all of those things that I think we're not going to be able to effectively evaluate next week. Yeah. yeah, Mark and I have discussed this in the last week or two because of the arts capital grants as we finalize what the contract looks like for that, just to ensure that we're compliant with state law. And there is some guidance from the state auditor's office. So as long as we hit certain check marks for the purpose of what we're doing, um, such as economic development, job creation, um, uh, cultural amenities, those kinds of things, um, or hit the marks of, of things like um, fees for services right. in exchange, uh, then we're okay. There's sort of a checklist of items that need to be incorporated into the contract. The fact that it's competitive tends to help um, rather than simply uh, appearing like a hand-picked organization that receives a gift. Mm -hmm. that's, that's not okay. Well, and I think the hardest part is evaluating whether we want to be in, in the example of, of two of them, the first money in, not knowing whether the projects are actually viable at this time, or if we want to come in later when there's more certainty that the projects are actually going to happen, which is something the competitive <laughs> grant process flushes out. Yes. So are you, um, so we have at least three, we got History Museum, we have we have the two that are in front of us right now. We have uh, Main Street. Is it is the question that in lieu of making a decision on those three next week that a certain amount of money will be set aside for a competitive grant process and then they would then resubmit under that is that what you're is that what you're suggesting i mean i think we asking? should discuss that option i'm just envisioning a discussion mm -hmm. of these three items <laughs> and what i'm envisioning is not a successful discussion <laughs> yeah I, I mean i like that idea because otherwise every year we get sure. these ad hoc sort of things and i mean so if you yeah. Yeah. If you, I, I like that idea. So I would say, yeah, if, if you want to make a motion now or come with a motion on the eighth to do Great. that more fleshed out. Then so, but wouldn't like that, that effectively mean that two of these would just go away because they're time sensitive? Which ones? I think the Home Allies and the History Museum are time sensitive, whereas the downtown maybe isn't because it's just part of their. In improvements downtown, but I might be wrong. I wasn't aware the Home Allies one was time sensitive. I know there's some things going on with the CAT grant with the Ames History Museum, but as far as I know, the state has not even released a grant application for the next round of CAT grants or a deadline for those yet either. That's correct. I haven't looked at that, so I don't they, know. What they've moved from a quarterly process to an annual process, mm -hmm. and they have not released any details about this year's funding. So, I don't, I don't know that it's super time sensitive. But to to your point, if we entertain these, uh, I guarantee that we're going to get a, a stream of these. YSS is building a huge facility. They would love to have some city funding and they could make a very good case for it. And the, you, know, you can go on down the line of very worthy causes. So um, I'm, I'm concerned about the precedent we're setting in terms of entertaining these. Well, aren't we setting a precedent by only entertaining the things that come directly to us then? Like just because Ames History Museum asked? Yeah, Tim's saying yeah, either don't entertain them yeah. at all, perhaps. Right. And or, I mean, I like... The, as an alternative, or I like the idea of making them compete for a pot of money that's predefined, perhaps. Right. And you put it, I mean, we then rely on the expertise of staff to evaluate them and how it relates to our goals. And obviously the funding piece is an important part of it for me, just because when you have a project that's 
with several million or several hundred thousand dollars and we're only a tiny fraction of that, I like to know where the rest of the funds are coming from as well. I don't I don't know that I have a problem with the idea, but with regard to the three that we have on the table now, are those capital grants? Yes. Two of them involve services. Well, the History Museum's first go was capital. The History right, but they Museum put it back. Capital grant. They There's put no it back through as a service. Right. I understand, so, but in the end, even if you're purchasing a component of a permanent exhibit, that's capital. <coughs> I mean, it is. I I don't know how they're how it fits with what our they could write it either were. way for yeah. what they need, right? So they could yeah. write it for and capital. half they're, of they're, the home allies is. To me, those are services. two completely different requests. Like, you have to actually build the facility and have it up and running before you start asking for money for, for services. services. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't think those two go together. Well, I'm just saying we've got three different types of requests here, and some of them involve services right now. Okay, so History Museum changed their approach. Only because we told them. That. And downtown, I don't even remember the, the scope. I guess well, that's not my understanding of the History Museum. From my conversations that I've had, they're approaching us, asking us to purchase a permanent exhibit in the new facility. Yeah, to create a portion of the exhibit focused on transportation. Which but is a the, capital request. But it's the, the creation. Dollar. I thought they were that it was couched in terms of the staff <coughs> time, et cetera, that goes into it, which is where they were going with the service. I don't know. I. It just feels like we've got three very different sorts mm -hmm. of requests that are on the table now, and we either want to discuss them or not at this time. So I, I don't know I don't know how the three things we've got now fit with a capital grant program. Well, I just think the third one from the no. Main Street is really okay. I think they're asking money Literally. and we would put it in because it's our I think it's our street. Yeah, I, I would say that it's our streetscape. They're just asking us to put it in. I don't think we're giving them money to do it. Mm. The, the, stuff, I, yeah, I and Main Street Main Street is actually doing maintenance on items. Yeah, I wasn't really the city actually owns lumping that one. You know, the, aren't they the asking us to put it in? I don't think they're saying give it to them and they'll right they'll yeah. minister a contract to get right. it done. I think they're saying they want you to put money aside for more benches or whatever. It's a little bit different group. Bike racks. You buy cracks, yeah. whatever. Flower flower planters or wish that the cool bench is just start with lighting. Thank you. <laughs> so John, are you wanting like separate I'm motions fine. on these? Well, I think I think that there's not been a motion yet. I think Amber's brought up. Do you want do you want to make a motion and see if it's if, to consider all these as I just of, want that to be a part of the discussion. I'm not necessarily okay. saying that's the way that it needs to go. I'm just not envisioning a very productive discussion on these two items. It'll take a lot of time. During a very long meeting already. So when do you help me give about? them much time at all is seems unfair to the regular I think it's really hard to evaluate two projects that are very expensive, not knowing really the feasibility of any of them at this point. The ones that the two that we the have two, in front of us. Yes, right. the two that are true capital requests. All right, so let's. Is, do you want a motion for something? Yeah. The, the, first of all, let's get a motion on these two items. If see if, if you are interested in having them be considered next week. And then we can talk next week about what Amber brought up. If we decide to go ahead and say we're going to fund Project A, but B and C, we want to see put into a, criteria, a competitive criteria, we can discuss that next week. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That way we're not making a final decision tonight. But I do see the fact, and we, we all know, I mean, just elephant in the room, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of opinions about a $50,000 or $100,000 request. And so... And some may have passion for it, and some may not. In terms of, so I think it's it's the criteria that we're being asked to, you know, to judge. So it's, I think it's it's a it's a good question to, uh, and that probably should be talked about first before you consider the specific project, essentially. So if if you want to make a motion, let me. I was just gonna um, move that we put.
these items on the eighth, is it? Mm -hmm. uh, for discussion. Okay. Second. All right. Those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? We should get carried. carried. And I don't think we need a motion on yours. Yeah, yeah. I just so we're going to make sure we have a discussion on whether or not yeah. how we're going to fund these extra projects next week. Just those, not a, not a, not a. You're talking about that's about two hundred thousand dollars is all you're looking for, then, right? Yeah. Not a a bigger program. Well, it's two hundred for there, and then there's another seventy for the. Uh, I'll be prepared to finance any or all of those three with recommendations, right? One hundred fifty thousand. It's about forty-nine. I'm say fifty thousand for the Forest Holson's request, and then another seventy thousand for the Main Street request. You're going to want a recommendation. That's if you do vote on it, I'll be prepared to tell you how to finance each and any one of them. Right? Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. No. Yep. Mm -hmm. Or you could put that all in. The, you could put that all in one big uh, program too. A a, a a grant program if you want to. Right. Yep. The nice thing is we don't have to reinvent that wheel. We've, we've used it before. So I, you just have to tell me the total amount because if I use that exact total amount, hmm. all three of those, that's right. all you're going to give out unless yeah. if someone else applies, there won't be any money left. Yeah, that, that does become the question is that if you open up a grant program, there may be other applicants that right. come in mm -hmm. and what do we want? Yep. What do you as a council want to commit to special projects? Is it is it more than that? Is it less than that? That's right. I, I think we're going to need some indication from the council. What are your priorities? Right. How are we to evaluate these things? It's well, you know, they are apples and oranges and all kinds mm -hmm. of other fruits. Um, <laughs> you know, they're they're not really related. So, how are we to explore these? And so, if you decide to go with the avenue of setting up a grant program, we'll need that kind of direction yeah. mm -hmm. to come back with recommendations. But a dollar amount will be important. You want it broader than just those three requests. Uh, How much should we fund the social services grant program for? Two hundred. Two hundred thousand. But it's two hundred and two different rounds, wasn't it? I think it was two hundred in one round and a hundred in a second round. Yeah. For capital. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was slightly different because we gave the money to United Way to administer. Right. And they determined the criteria, and um, I think there was some guidance about what the council was interested in, but. It was ultimately up to United Way. So would it, would it be helpful for us to ask staff tonight to come back to the next meeting? It seems like if we're starting from scratch next meeting, that could be sort of a conversation by itself. Would you want a motion to come back to the council with some alternatives for structuring uh, a grant program? Or do we just work? Well, first, that? you got to decide whether you want the grant program. If you do. Then we'll just allocate the money in the budget on the eighth for a total amount of money. And then you'll direct us to come back with a pro come back with recommendations on a program. If there's the majority would rather just vote each one of those separately, just those three separately, then there's no reason to take time to develop any criteria right now. And the benefit, distinction? benefit of following that that approach would be is we're not just trying to do it on a merit of a letter. Mm -hmm. Staff can ask a lot more questions and, and do some more investigation. So I think it's a good. But but if you open it up, that does mean there could be oh, 10 support. applications. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yep. So you're not but guaranteeing those three. Right. And is $200,000 enough? I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm not looking for a million dollar program, although you have <laughs> available. My only observation and suggestion to council as we think about it is that the Main Street one is really its maintenance of most Our of it with, that we actually already own or just taken down. Yeah, you're going to have to decide where you agree that need, work needs to be done or not. And I, I think if something assigned to Public Works to pull off. Okay. If you have an opportunity to walk down and just look at some of the items oh, yeah. um, before next Tuesday night, I think you'll observe that it's some of them really need to be taken care of. So anyway, but that being said, that's for you all to decide. All right. Anything else? So, so to your answer to the question, answer your question, then really, I think that that would be then, if they decide to go with the grant program, then that motion could be made next next week to ask staff to come back at a future meeting with some direction, and you'll probably have to ask us question or ask, ask council questions for some direction in terms of what's the criteria that you want to set for like the grant process. That clear? Yep. All right. I have one additional you sort of budget you question. You voted on it? I forgot. You voted on that then? Right yeah. Yes. Just to bring it back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pardon me. 
Vody, just to yes. bring them back down. Yeah. I had, I had another sort of big picture budget question. Um, so we had a brief discussion regarding climate action as it relates to the CAP process. The recommendations from the consultant won't be to us until April. Maybe yes. So it's challenging from us from a timing perspective. Um, it would be very difficult for us to come back and redo this work. And I have a lot of concerns with, with across the board cuts. Like if we wanted to put, if there was a, a motion to try to, to include a climate component into our operating budget, is, is that even a possibility? Now, you have a million dollars, a million dollars for your priorities, a million dollars. So I don't know about operations just yet. Again, I'm gonna have to give you a, an implementation this is not something that's going to be done in one year. When we get this, it's going to be multi-million dollars that we're going to have to have a financial strategy for you. And it's not, I know everyone wants to rush to do something in the next six months, but this has to be a well thought out. It will affect property taxes and, and electric rates and other utility rates. So uh, if you're looking for a low hanging fruit, I've given you that actually it's $1.2 million if you want to do things, but you're not going to jump, be able to jump on right away. There's going to be a delay there. When we go, we'll go. I guarantee we'll go fast. But you can't just say, I'm going to run off here and spend $10 million tomorrow. So really, we should be looking at this as if major climate issues or climate budgetary issues would be handled in the next budget, not this one. Yes. Am but I saying I, that correctly? Put aside a million dollars for if there's some things we can move on right away. <clears throat> we can buy all that. It won't happen. 10,000 electric cars tomorrow. And for a million dollars, we'll be able to move on it. You're talking about operationally. Uh, these things are the type of, uh, these are kind of uh, investments we're gonna have to borrow money from because these are larger sums. Right. See what I'm saying? So I don't know, I'm not, I'm not sure what you're contemplating we could put into an operating budget to meet 80%. We're talking about big things now. Right. So are you thinking about something? No, you answered my question. I mean, I just, I, just feasibility, it's just so sort of unfortunate that the, the requests aren't gonna come till April and this, this work's going to be by and large done. So, yeah. I, well, the point is, it'll come back with proposed projects, but the plan won't even be done until September or October. We have to have a, an implementation and then plan. Steve has made There's it very a clear. Strategy it's going to take work a, and a strategy of financing. You're going to have to be able to buy off on that. We're going to have to work with our bond advisors and things. I mean, this is, and you talk about your debt capacity and all that. You're going to have to. Really look at this. I know people are. That's why it's a little nerve wracking for us because that um, 2030 is knocking on our door, and I know you don't want to lose a year in there, but you got to do this right. And when we get going, we'll get going. We'll, you know, we're serious about getting accomplished. But you need to know the cost. The public needs to know the cost for transparency. Is everybody backing this? Um, that's why the task force, maybe the mayor is going to set up, is important too. It is not just the city of Ames. I mean, our organization, what is the, you know, the industrial community going to do? What is the university going to do? If you're really going to do this, you can't just say our organization is going to solve the problem. We're all going to be this together. Everybody's going to have a role to play. Everybody's going to have to invest in it in different ways, maybe, too. They have different things. This is a big undertaking. To accomplish it, it takes everybody pulling together. I'm hopeful that everybody wants to get there. How much will they pay over what period of time are they willing to pay? You know, we've tried to try to level these things. I don't even say level. We we create things like this so people are acceptable. People get nervous when your electric bill goes up 30%, your property tax goes up 30%. So it is possible you have an array of options before you. Can we pick ones that we can level, uh, have a, a, a slight increase to pay more on? That's going to be the art of all this, right? And convincing people, you know, that they're willing to do that. make. Make lifestyle changes, right? It can be about lifestyle changes with using the bus more than cars. There's going to be a, a lot of things we're going to have to work on. This is a it's a heavy lift, but cities are doing it throughout uh, the country. But I don't want you to say don't want to be rushed into this. They were going to get this done in six months. Right. It's got to be a well thought out plan. And it's also something that that's made it a point when we had all the people in the audience when you were talking about setting that budget made it very clear. 
that's not going to be this budget year. It's going to be next budget year before we can even get to it because the plan won't be here. Maybe, you know, Deb's all queued up. She's ready. She's excited. She wants to go ahead. And but, but let me say before Deb, that doesn't mean before you start to talk about, about this plan or until we get the plan that we're still not going to do things to try to reduce our carbon footprint. Corey's still going to, we're still going to try to get all electric vehicles, whether you tell us to or not, if there was a plan or not. We're going to get out in front. We're trying to get these pickup trucks. We're going to experiment with everything. So I don't want you to think we're going to stop as, a, as an organization and not move ahead with trying to reduce our carbon footprint. We're going to try to do that in the next swimming pool if we can afford it, right? We're going to talk to our, our architect about that, our next big building. That's the next build, big building. So I don't want you to think we're stopping just because we don't have the implementation plan. So that's kind of the low-hanging fruit we're going to keep working with. But so I hope that gives you some Yep, very comfort. helpful. Plus you got the waste. Waste to energy mm -hmm. study coming got back. That. That's going to be a major uh, undertaking when you see that and the, and the cost of that. And what does it reduce our carbon footprint? All these are going to have to be put through that sieve. What is the most cost effective way to get to your goal of that 83% and by such and such date? And there'll be different options to get there. Okay, Deb, beat me down. Now. Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, I would just add. So, um, April 5th is the steering committee meeting in which uh, SSG, you'll, you'll have those low carbon action steps before you. And I think it's really important to remember, this is really going to come as a packaged um, deal for you. And so um, I think we have to be careful when we talk about, um, we like this idea, but not that idea, or we'll do this idea, but not that idea. Um, what SSG, we had a weekly meeting with them today, and what they said is that there'll be some packaged um, options, and because of the ambitious goal and trying to get there um, in 2030, uh, we're now taking big steps instead of small steps. And so when council sees these action steps, SSG is going to want to know that evening, okay, do you like this? What don't you like about it? Do you want to move forward? Do you want to look or consider changing the goal? Those are those are some of the things that will enter into the conversation um, in that meeting that evening. So just to kind of prepare you uh, and what to expect, and, and we'll be doing some more um, educating not only of um, the input committee but the public. We're getting the survey ready, but it, it's it's slowed down because we're adding those costs to it, so that people who are taking the survey know, you know, what, what are these estimates? What am I, what would I be agreeing to if I want to, to take these actions? And, and can I agree to that? So it, it's, it's slowed down a little bit, but I, but I, we're still looking at pushing that um, survey out probably the week of the 14th of February 14th, leaving it open for three weeks, um, getting the help of the input committee to, um, to, to push it out, put, pull the focus groups together. So all of that information will then be provided to you um, in time for that meeting on April 5th. But just right. just kind of setting the stage and what to prepare I'm, for. I'm confused. So how do we put price tags on the survey if we don't have the recommendations back till April? So, so they're working on the recommendations. So right now they had, they had a series of assumptions or recommendations. We're kind of using them interchangeably and those all went to the technical team and so they've been vetted through the technical team ssg called the technical team members and talked to them based on the responses they got back um, in writing and so then they're taking that information and they're modeling it right now and then they're going to be assigning cost estimates to to each of those and then that's that's in a high level um perspective, that's the information that will be provided through the survey. We have not seen the survey yet to, to even know what, what all is included, but that will go through the project team and, and the technical team as well before it goes out, because we want people to be well informed about what it is that they would be agreeing or disagreeing to. So do, does the council have an interest in seeing the survey before it goes out? <laughs> I trust the team. Mm -hmm. I don't, yeah. Well, respectfully, the, the survey before, I have major concerns with that. And that's that's why I have an interest in saying this, because the survey oh, yeah. asked people for their opinions without giving any kind of sense of what the cost would be. We've okay. never done anything like this before. We could talk to the consultants. And if we want to have meaningful feedback, I think it would be helpful for the council 
to at least have an opportunity to give feedback on. Let us talk to the consultant about it. We, wow. I know Susan goes over the annual sort of Susan satisfaction survey before it's sent out with you, you know, kind of ask mm -hmm. your opinion. So if it's possible, it might be a good idea. Can we ask our consultant, we'll get back. Quite well taken. I, we, we know there were concerns with that first survey. That we conveyed those concerns. Um, so yeah, we can Let us check. We'll check with that. Let's check. That's mm -hmm. a good suggestion. I want to use semantics again when Deb talks about steps. I'm trying to differentiate between strategies and steps. That package of strategies might, I'll make this up. We're going to go 100% solar, you know what I mean, in 10 years. That's kind of a strategy or a step to get there. I'm talking about the implementation steps. Those are the ones that then we turn over to Don Com and he said, here's what it's going to take to get there, the financing and all the things we have to do. So they're implementation steps where I was talking, using right. that terminology. That was using step package steps, but I see those as kind of strategies. Yeah, yeah. that's a good that's a good delineation. Yeah, yep, yep. Helpful. So, Deb, on the uh, Corey mentioned that for the climate action plan, there's going to be facility changes potentially. So, SSG is also asking staff to weigh in on what they see is the viability, what they see is the cost implications, what else they see. So it's not just more or less. Steve said, you know, buying a, a, a thousand electric vehicles, it's like, how are you going to get the infrastructure for recharging them? And um, what's the feasibility of that? And where are they going to be stored? Just for sake of, I'm not saying it is it, but for the sake of the session, but they're part and parcel of that conversation. So we don't see something. And then all of a sudden we say, oh, that's, that's well, let's go with this. And then staff says, well, wait a minute. <laughs> you forgot that we have to replace all the power systems here. We have to do all of this and all of this. And that happens to be this. We want a complete picture. Is that what's happening with SSG yes. or not? Yep. That, that's part of the conversation as well. Yeah. Looking at the whole, it's a, it's a big whole picture too, mm -hmm. as you can imagine. <clears throat> yeah. yeah I, I'm trying to imagine how you could construct a survey question that looks at an, a, uh, a thoughtful discussion on property taxes. I mean, that's hard to explain under normal circumstances, but if someone was going to be experience a pretty significant increase in property taxes, I mean, I just think that's hard to explain to people. Um, so, well, if it's, let's just say that if it includes electric rates, there's some pretty big electric users that are actually pretty big employers in this community. They need to be weighing in and giving council feedback too, in terms of, I mean, I know there's one major employer that is looking at potentially doing an expansion, but let's just say that he says, well, if that electricity, I'm, I'm just saying, what if mm -hmm. that goes way up? Well, wait a minute. We're a national corporation or international corporation. We'll just look someplace else because this is going to make it unfeasible because they're building their financial model based on input costs. Uh, employment and and the light too. So I mean, there's a lot of pieces, and that's where the task force will come in as well too. But if we're doing a survey that has implications to business and industry direct costs, they need to be. We need feedback from them for sure as right. well, right? Because it's that, that's that is a uh, potentially a big impact. So. So yeah, and in addition, in addition to the task force, I would say too with the focus groups, making sure that we have that voice coming through on the on the focus groups. What what would work? What wouldn't work? What would it take to make the changes to to um, address the the overall goal? Yeah, definitely. That input's needed. Okay, we'll check on that survey first. Right. Okay, good discussion. Thank you. Council comments. Bradman. None for me tonight. Thanks. Rachel? Doesn't tie. Yeah. No. Doesn't. No. I have one, and that is I will be sending you an email about an addition to the budget for a continuation for one year of the small art grant pilot program with a, at a funding level of $30,000 to expand it a bit. We'll put that down. And I'll send that email to you. I've already talked to Steve about it. 15. Yeah. All right. 30. All right, and just as a quick update, we talked last time about the uh, legislature working on the sales tax. Downtown. And I've been in contact with Steve and in contact with Dwayne. There was a subcommittee meeting that happened this afternoon. Um, it's being tracked, and uh, there's a tremendous amount of interest in a lot of communities. Uh, I can't sit here today and tell you whether or not 
it is or isn't going to impact us, but uh, we're you know, being mindful of that. And by way of, it, it's interesting, the House has one bill, and they just want to go, just do personal income tax reform, and that's it. The governor wants to do personal and corporate tax reform, and the Senate has personal, corporate, and going to a statewide one cent sales tax, which would basically retire the uh, our one cent size tax. Um, I did have a conference call through the Iowa League of City Executive Committee with Senator Dawson yesterday. And I will say that I was very encouraged by his willingness to listen and wants to understand what the implications were, but he just said, None of this will have any adverse impact on any city that's collecting one cent sales tax. And so there was multiple people who heard that and we're going to uh, continue to uh, communicate with them to say that's really important because, and it's home that we pay for human services uh, agencies. That's important you know, community betterment. And they liked hearing the fact that 60% goes to property tax reduction, uh, which is an important to them also. So anyway, we'll just keep you kind of, up to speed, but uh, as anticipated, it's going to be a very busy few months um, already with the <laughs> legislature. Um, but uh, with that said, I would entertain a motion to adjourn for this evening. So we adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Some favor say aye. 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 All right. We are adjourned and enjoy your evening, and mm. we'll see you tomorrow night.